Good morning. Welcome to our service on this beautiful August summer day. We come to a place where we are reminded that no matter what, God calls us beloved and God loves us and calls us to love one another. I'm grateful that you're here. I welcome the folks who are with us online. We're grateful for you as well. If you'd like to find our bulletin and sermon notes and announcements that I'll be sharing, you can go to haddonfieldumc.org slash now, our website slash now. Today, as we join to worship God, we are at the precipice right before we begin an exciting week here, which is Vacation Bible School. Uh, tomorrow, we, uh, we will welcome up to 165 kids. I think our registration is around that, and around 100 volunteers. And so this uh, place will be transformed. And I just, I cannot say enough about Julie Robertson, who is our Director of Children and Family Ministries, and all those who have been volunteering behind the scenes and will volunteer. We're grateful for your efforts. Anyone here volunteering this week? Raise your hand if you're volunteering. We're grateful. Thank you. Uh, we will have a time of, of prayer for VBS in the service. Um, if you would like to support this ministry, uh, after church today, we're going to have a little bit of a decorating party, um, and everyone is welcome to come to the Welcome Center around noon. We're going to be dispersed throughout the building getting the space ready. So if you have some time, uh, feel free to volunteer today. We are also still welcoming donations for VBS. We have needs that come up midweek. Um, on page eight, you'll see how to donate to support that effort. Our mission collection this summer has been for backpack and school supplies for kids in disadvantaged areas and situations. We have a few mission partners that we donate these school supplies to. The Neighborhood Center in Camden, Ascenda, which used to be Robin's Nest, as well as um, uh, Respond Inc. in Camden. If you would like to donate school supplies for children in our area, please go to pages eight and nine. You'll see a list and information of how to donate those. Um, we normally have something called Coffee with the Pastors, the second Sunday of every month, and that we are uh, going to postpone that until October. That will resume again in October, um, so there will be none this week or in September. And then the last thing that uh, I'd like to share before we rise and worship God and in word and spirit is that we've had uh, a couple incredible volunteers here uh, who are going to college. One is um, Jolie Collins. I think Jolie might be in that room running a camera right now. Jolie is going to college, um, and she has been a volunteer with us. Jolie is right there in the balcony. Uh, and Jolie, what college are you going to? Ithaca College in New York. And we have Joel Shahovsky, who's been a volunteer, but this summer he's been an intern with us. And Joel's going to Widener University this week. So let's thank them for their time and <laughs> bid them well. Thank you, guys. They make the live stream possible, and they've been incredible volunteers. Well, friends, I invite you, as you're able, if you would, rise in body and spirit and join the call to worship on page three. Sleeper, awake, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Let us put away falsehood and embrace the truth. Turn from bitterness and offer forgiveness. Here, let us worship God, not only in words, but in spirit and in truth. God, you have called us to produce fruits worthy of repentance. Receive our lives and build with us healing and wellness in our community and in our world. Create within us a unity of heart that your love and grace may shine through us and transform the lives of others. Amen. Friend, remain standing as you're able for the singing of our opening hymn, number 138. Thank mm -hmm. you.
Today, among the excitement of preparing for Vacation Bible School, we also have the great privilege to uh, welcome new members in our congregation. And between our 9 o'clock service and this service, I think we are welcoming 17 new members uh, today in the life of our congregation. We can give God uh, praise for that. And so I'd like to invite those who are uh, joining today by, by transfer or profession of faith. You can come and join us up, up front here. And I invite our lay leader as well. We have, we have uh, received requests that, uh, to identify who is who, because you have a list of people. So Penny Sue Spohn, Spohn is uh, transferring from a United Methodist congregation. We're grateful for Penny. And then this beautiful family, Ermilla, Ajay, and William, we welcome you in our midst and uh, grateful to have them also. Um, so b membership in the United Methodist Church is rooted in baptism. It's how we live out our baptismal vow. And often those uh, vows are made over us as children, or maybe we make them as an adolescent or an adult, but um, we reclaim those baptismal vows as a part of our membership. And so um, if you would turn to page 33 in your hymnal, we will remember our baptism together. And so this great remembrance, we say, brothers and sisters in Christ, it is through the sacrament of baptism that we are initiated into Christ's holy church, incorporated into God's mighty acts of salvation, and given new birth into God's might, and given new birth through water and this spirit. All of this is God's gift to us without price. So on page 34, we remember our baptismal vows. Friends, on behalf of the church, I ask you to reclaim do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? If so, say, I do. And do you accept the freedom and power that God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? If so, say, I do. Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in his grace, and promise to serve him as your Lord in union with the church which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races? If so, say, I do. I ask to all congregation on page 35, do you as Christ's body, the church, reaffirm both your rejection of sin and your commitment to Christ? We do. Will you nurture one another in the Christian faith and life and include these persons now before you in your care? With God's help, God's help, we will we proclaim, proclaim the good news and live according to the example of Christ. We will surround these persons with a community of love and forgiveness, that they may grow in their trust of God and be found faithful in their service to others. We will pray for them that they may be true disciples who walk in the way that leads to life. And then on page 38, we ask these questions of membership. The first membership in the United Methodist Church. As members of Christ's universal church, will you be loyal to the United Methodist Church and do all in your power to strengthen its ministries? If so, say, I will. It's a reception into the local congregation. As members of this congregation, will you faithfully participate in its ministries by your prayers, by your presence, your gift, your service, and your witness. If so, say, I will. I will. And as, as a sign of uh, welcome and hospitality for the membership, we have a church member, Dan Cummings. Dan attends the 9 o'clock service, and he has uh, made these crosses, these, these pocket crosses, in his own wood shop and wants all of our new members to have one. And so Pastor Jason has these as a sign of welcome and uh, of gratitude. I'll go the other way. Yes, Welcome. Congratulations. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you. How do we welcome our new siblings in Christ? You may be seated. Thank you. 
We also would like to uh, take a moment and pray for those who will be serving in Vacation Bible School um, starting tomorrow. I would, we didn't prepare them for this, but if you are volunteering for VBS, it would be okay standing up here. I want to invite you to come forward for a prayer of blessing over our ministry. So I want to invite all of our Vacation Bible School volunteers to come forward, and Pastor G. Sun's going to offer a prayer. You can just stand right on the floor in the front here. Picture 100 volunteers and 165 kids, and that's, that's what we're praying for today. I want to invite you in the pews, if you would just reach out a hand and as we offer our prayers to these folks. Let us pray. A loving and gracious God, thank you so much for this opportunity to serve you and serve the surrounding area in our community. Oh Lord, we are so grateful for each of the volunteers who bring their gift and their willingness and their heart to, to proclaim the good news uh, into our community. Oh Lord, bless our hearts and mind and bless our our words and actions and fill our heart with the joy that you, you, you can only give us. Bless our children who will join us. Let them experience how good it is to walk with you on their journey and walk with us and help them to find the depth of your love and the warmth of your grace. We love you so much. Use us as the sign of your love and hope in our community. We pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Thank you all. You may be seated. It is... So good to see you, but later I will come back.
Good morning again. I'm so grateful to worship with you, uh, our God, who is good and faithful all the time on this beautiful summer Sunday morning. Whether this is your first time joining us or many times to worship with us, with us I invite you to go to God in prayer to center ourselves and pause and take a deep breath, experience God's loving presence. I invite you to close your eyes. Take a deep breath. Give thanks to God. Open your heart. Lift up your heart. And please join your heart with mine in prayer. Oh, loving and gracious God, thank you so much for this beautiful day, revealing yourself to us and inviting us to worship you in your loving presence. We are here to worship you. We are here to praise you. We are here because you, we love you. We long for you. We search for you, oh Lord. Hear our prayers and receive our worship and praise. We give you thanks for so many things uh, in our lives. Especially we give you thanks for new members joining us today. We give you thanks for ministry opportunities in and beyond our community. Especially give us uh, strength during the week while we host, while we share the good news through Vacation Bible School. Keep us safe and give us new strength and find new joy and joy of salvation each and every day. We want to grow in love every step of the way. We want to know the light of the world who stepped down into darkness to be with us. Help us to proclaim your goodness and faithfulness to the people around us in our words and actions, decisions and steps. Oh God, let our lives be a fragrant, fragrant offering on the journey of transformation of our hearts and lives as we build up your church by being kind to each other, forgiving each other, and follow the way of love as Jesus taught us. We lift up our prayers for our family and friends who need your extra grace today, for those who need your wisdom Provide more than enough to follow your guidance. For those who are struggling from their health concerns, touch their body, mind, and spirit with your healing hands on their healing journey. Release your grace of peace and comfort on your children who are mourning the unexpected loss of their loved ones. We lift up our worry and fear before you who know what our heart is, where our heart is before we say a word, who know our deep pain and sorrow, who know our hopes and dreams. We are perfectly imperfect, but you know us, you made us, and you call us to love you and love each other. When we are overwhelmed by the division and hostility in reality, Give us faith to trust you are at work for good for those who love you. Oh God, surround us with your love and care. Let us grow in mutual respect, love, and forgiveness. Oh God, let your peace be on earth as it is in heaven. We mourn for the victims of violence around the world, especially children and their family. Be with them and let your peace be real in their lives and have mercy on us. We pray all these, our spoken and unspoken prayers of heart, in the name of Jesus, our Christ, who loves us more than we can imagine, and pray together with the word that Jesus taught us how to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thy needs the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I invite you to stand as you are able to join our hymn singing number 390, Forgive Our Sins As We Forgive. for us today is in the book of Ephesians, chapter 4, verse 25 to chapter 5, verse 2. The scripture can be found on page 194 in the New Testament of the Pew Bible. So then, putting away falsehood, let all of us speak the truth to our neighbors, for we are members of one another. Be angry, but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and do not make room for the devil. Thieves must give up stealing. Rather, let them labor and work honestly with their own hands, so as to have something to share with the needy. Let no evil talk come out of your mouths, but only what is useful for building up, as there is need so that your words may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with which you were marked with the seal for the day of redemption. Put away from you all bitterness and wrath and anger and wrangling and slander, together with all malice, and be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ has forgiven you. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and live in love as Christ loved us and gave us up for us a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank God. Thank you, Ajay. Friends, I invite you to turn to page six in your bulletin. We have uh, sermon notes we've prepared for you. There are some uh, fill-in-the-blank questions if you'd like to follow along. And uh, it always helps me with active listening. Today, I'm curious if you've ever had to uh, give something up or cut something out of your diet or of your life. Anyone? Yeah? Mostly everyone? Now, not all attempts are successful, so if you have successfully cut out a a habit or food from your, your life, what caused you to be successful?
Replacement. You guys go right to the right answer. That's, that's good. We're well trained. You know, I have learned that in the various habits I've tried to get rid of or food elements I've, I've had to remove from my diet, that giving something up is always easier when we replace it, rather simply subtract it from our behavior. Uh, a number of years ago, I found out that I had to stop eating wheat and barley and gluten of any sort for medical reasons. And um, the one little inconvenience to that was I had recently thrown myself into a newfound passion, which was bread making. I had uh, I'd been to France a number of times and fell in love with the boule bread. Did anyone, you know what a boule? It's that round loaf with the crisscross and, and the flour, and I can just taste it. And the boule bread is, has, at its best, has a crispy crust and is soft in the middle. So I learned how they make this. And so I bought baking stones. I bought all kinds of special supplies to make this bread. And, you know, if you put it in the oven, you put a tray of water underneath it to create steam. That is what causes European and especially French bread to be crusty on the outside and soft on the inside. So I was, you know, becoming a very skilled bread maker. I even got involved in friendship bread, sourdough. I was feeding my own dough. And then I found out, well, you're making yourself sick. So you need to stop, right? And when we try and stop something at the beginning, it's a matter of, of willpower. My willpower only goes so far. And so what I ultimately found was that in order to, to not lose all passion for life, I had to become passionate about other things. So I actually learned to make my own hummus, started to get into making other spreads and, and foods. And, and my wife and I found all these recipes that were healthy replacements for bread, not, not gluten-free rolls, but quinoa salad and different types of brown rice mix. And, and I really got excited about other types of cooking so that my food wasn't just, you know, loveless, but I had to replace one thing for the other. And I know that if you've ever had to, to kick a habit, I know lots of smokers that have taken up chewing gum or Nicorette or whatever it may be, cutting something out by elimination is not so effective. So, when the Apostle Paul says to the church, you and me, just as he said to the church in Ephesus, put away from you all bitterness and wrath and anger and wrangling and slander, together all ma with all malice, I say to Paul, Paul, great advice, but how? Throughout the last month, Pastor Jesus and I have been preaching through the letter of Paul to the Ephesians. And last week, we talked about what it looks like to have unity in Christ, despite all of our differences. And many of you said, Pastor Chris, thank you. That was a great me message. I just don't know how. How to do it. See, the Apostle Paul is writing to a church that was divided. They were divided over religion. They were divided over language. They were divided over ethnicity and tradition. Ephesus was a trade city, so it had a, quite a diversity of religious and ethnic background. And the majority of the church in Ephesus, which is modern-day Turkey, by the way, they were Gentiles, which means non-Jews. Some of the Jewish Christians told the Gentiles, in order to follow Jesus, you first have to become Jewish, which means you have to be circumcised, and you have to obey the laws of Moses found in the Torah. And so they were fighting and arguing and disputing, and Paul comes back to Ephesus, and he says, okay, folks, everybody calm down. Jesus died so that the dividing wall between us would be torn down. Jesus abolished the commandment. We don't have to live a checklist of do's and don't, but Jesus gives us a new covenant, which is the covenant of love. And it's a covenant of the Spirit. And so what we find in this passage, Ephesians 4, Paul is writing specifically to the Gentiles, giving them a primer teaching them things that are in the Hebrew law. So they wouldn't have known the Ten Commandments, the Gentiles. But Paul is, is not teaching anything new. He says, put away falsehood 
and tell the truth. That's from the Ten Commandments. Which commandment is that? Thou shalt not bear false witness. Don't lie. So Paul's saying, don't lie. Tell the truth, right? Then he says, thieves must stop stealing. Which, ten, which commandment is that? Thou shalt not steal. And then he says, let no hateful or hurtful speech come out of your mouth or wickedness against another person. Which commandment is that? Well, you might actually say it's not in the Ten Commandments. But Jesus says it is. In Matthew 5, Jesus says, you heard it was said you shall not murder. But I tell you, if you hate a brother or a sister, or if you say raka, which is the Greek word that means idiot or fool or jerk, Jesus says, if you say raka, you are liable to the law and you have broken the commandment not to murder. Because Jesus says it's not always about the outward action, it's about the inward spirit. And so the Apostle Paul is teaching the church exactly what Jesus has taught us, that we must love our neighbor as ourself, not hate, not hurt, not resent, but instead to build up. Now when Paul says to put away one set of things, I ask the question, how? Well, he then encourages the Ephesians to take something up in its place. When he says, put away falsehood, he says, take up truth. He says, tell the truth in love. When he says that thieves should stop stealing, he doesn't just say, put it away, but he says, then they should earn money honestly so that they have something for those who are in need. I, I think about, I don't know if you've ever traveled in uh, developing countries or uh, the Middle East particularly. Pickpocketing is an industry. And you might chuckle, but it really is a way that, that classes of people, particularly poor people, support themselves preying on unsuspecting and sometimes arrogant foreigners who come with a lot of money to be tourists and people who, who have very few means pickpocket as a way of living. I imagine in the city of Ephesus, there were a lot of foreigners coming in and out, and some of the members of that church, probably the only way they could support themselves was to pickpocket or to participate in this industry. And Paul is saying, you need to stop. And instead, he says, the way that you stop stealing is to think about others. He doesn't say earn honestly for yourself. He says, earn money honestly so that you have money to give to people who are in need. Paul causes us to pivot away from our own focus and to focus on other things. Put this away and take this up, caring for others. It resonates with me words that John the Baptist said in the Gospel of Luke. In Luke's version of Jesus' baptism, John is in the wilderness at the River Jordan and he says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. But in Luke, he then says, produce fruits worthy of repentance. John the Baptist in that version doesn't just say repent. It's not all about the words. He talks about the work of repentance. He says, produce fruits worthy of repentance. And people say, well, what do you mean? And he says, well, if you have two coats, give one away. He says, if you've defrauded anyone, pay them back. And he says to the Roman soldiers, don't abuse the people. Don't abuse your power, but serve others. So there's something about the work of redemption. Has anyone here ever had to go to physical therapy? Not fun, right? Physical therapy is not fun. Physical therapy is what? It's work. It's work if you've torn something. I tore a rotator cuff one time. And I literally could not get anything off the top shelf at a grocery store for a year. Do you know why? I wasn't doing physical therapy, right? I was waiting for it to go away. How did that work? It didn't, right? It is only the work of restoration that can bring about healing, not only to our joints and to our bodies, but also to our spirits and to our souls, right? Paul answers that question when he talks about loving and not being hateful and angry. 
Is it not right for us sometimes to be angry, right? There's injustice in the world. There are children dying in parts of the world. There's war. There's fighting. There's people in our own backyard causing harm to others. Should we not be angry? And Paul says, yes, be angry, but do not sin. The question is, what do you do with your anger? Does your anger cause you to harm others? Does your anger cause you to tear someone down? Does your anger cause you to strike out or to take revenge? If so, James says, be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For in the same way, he says, your anger does not produce God's righteousness. If you have righteous indignation, allowing anger to drive your behavior will ultimately produce more hurt and more anger. Today, last week I shared that there is a lot of anger around us. Yes? I, I feel like we swim in a sea of anger and bitterness and wrangling and discontentment and all of these other things that Paul has said to put away. And so again, I come back to the question, how? How? How can we escape from the endless new loop of negativity and division that we experience in our world? Well, listen to this statement. Paul says, Put away from you all bitterness and wrath and anger and wrangling and slander together with all malice and be kind to one another tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ has forgiven you. The word and is the crucial turning point. Paul is in dismissing bitterness. Let me tell you, folks, sometimes bitterness is hard-earned and hard-won. We are bitter because people have harmed us. We, we resent people who have done harm and trauma to us. You cannot simply turn it off without the and, right? It's one thing to stop eating another thing. It is more successful if you replace it. And so Paul says to us, replace bitterness with kindness. Replace malice with compassion, which is tenderheartedness. And replace anger with forgiveness. I think we can learn something here from modern psychology. Any of you ever heard of John Gottman? John Gottman is considered to be the father of family therapy or of marriage therapy. John, I believe, lived in Cherry Hill at one time, but his work is known around the world. And Gottman coined this, uh, this idea that there are four horsemen of relationships that usher in the end or the death of a relationship. In, in the book of Revelation, the four horsemen are the ones who usher in the apocalypse. We know that the return of Christ is coming when these four horsemen have come. So John Gottman, who's a therapist, not a preacher, he says that in marriage relationships or romantic relationships or really any relationship, if these four characteristics are present, the end of that relationship is near. And he doesn't identify them just so you can predict which marriage is going to fall apart and not. It's about intervention. If these things are present, you know you need to intervene quickly and hard. It's just like if you can't raise your arm, you need to do something quickly about it before you have permanent damage. So I want to review these four horsemen. They're in, the page, in page six on the sermon notes. Number one, and this, by the way, it was developed for uh, romantic relationships, but I believe it, it applies to all human relationships. Number one, criticism. You walk in the kitchen. I thought you were going to do the dishes. These were here when I went to work, right? Criticism. Has anyone ever experienced criticism? Okay. It happens, right? It might have happened this morning. But when it's a constant trickle, criticism leads to Contempt. I, she just noticed I didn't do the dishes, but I took out the garbage and I cleaned the house and I picked the kids up yesterday. If I wash the dishes now, she's just going to ask something else of me. She never appreciates anything I do. That's a soundtrack of contempt, right? Think about if you go see family, right? 
You ask how everyone's doing. They don't ask about you. They don't ask about your family. You get in the car to go home. They didn't ask how we were. They don't care. All they can think about is themselves. They never cared about us anyway. That is a soundtrack of contempt. Are you with me, church? Yes. Number three, defensiveness. Defensiveness. Make a left turn. You're going to miss your left turn. I know where I'm going. I drive this route every week, right? Defensiveness. I see a lot of ribbing with couples. I'm not talking to you. I'm talking with you, right? When we, of course, there's the typical defensiveness, but when you literally, have you been in a relationship where you literally feel like you can't say a word? You're walking on eggshells because you, everyone is so darn defensive. Number four. Now, this is, this is the last of the horsemen that when this fo- fellow shows up, you know you're in trouble. And this is stonewalling. How's your day? Fine. Goes into the room, closes the door, right? When this is the repeated pattern, there's no, no space, no space to heal. When you shut down, when you close off, when you unfriend, when you disinvite, when you remove people from the actual authentic experience of your life, you stonewall them. You literally build a wall between you and them. If you do not dismantle it quickly, the fabric of that relationship is torn. Now, Gottman identifies these four horsemen not to predict the end of a relationship, but to prevent it, to intervene. And so he proposes four interventions or antidotes to the four horsemen. The first, my favorite, this is the gentle startup. So the antidote to criticism walks in the door. You never do, you didn't do the dishes. I left them here this morning. The antidote to that is, instead of saying that first thing when you walk in the door, walk in the door and say, hi, right? It's different. How was your day? I know you have a lot going on, but you didn't get to the dishes. You must be busy. Maybe after dinner, you could get to them, right? The gentle startup. Sometimes we immediately go for that which frustrates us. If you want to undo it, if you want to do the work, the gentle startup. Now, the next one, contempt, right? He never does anything. He doesn't pull his weight around here, right? The appreciation. I appreciate how good you are with the kids. I am really grateful for all that you've done to support me. I have learned in my own life when dealing with people's criticisms or harsh feedback or anger or fear, always start with thank you. And, and I, I say this from the bottom of my heart, not a fake thank you, but a real thank you. You know, sometimes I'll get an email in which a person just lets me know where they're coming from in a way where you feel the wind off the email. Thank you so much for caring about your church. I really appreciate your heart and your passion. However, no, it's, a, it's a nice however. How can we nurture a spirit of gratitude? Those people who hurt us or whose opinions drive us nuts, nurturing moments and culture of gratitude, it's not just good to do, it diffuses the bomb. In my previous church, there was a, a church matriarch. Her name is Mary. Sweetest woman I've ever met. Mary also got a lot done in the church, and she, she did everything, but in my years at that church, she was developing dementia, and it was very sad, because Mary, who had propped up the roof forever, no longer remembered what day it was, and was repeating herself over and over. And so church members often came to me and said, I, I, I don't know how to interact with Mary. It's so sad. She used to be so strong. And, and one of the church members named Margaret taught me something. Margaret herself 
had journeyed with her own mom who had developed Alzheimer's disease. And Margaret said, I have learned with, that living with my mom's Alzheimer's, that it's not about having conversations like you would normal that involve the past or the future. She said, but it's all about creating beautiful moments in, in the moment now. And so I would see her with Mary, and she would say, why, Mary, what a beautiful scarf you have on. And Mary would immediately perk up, and she would say, it is. Red is my favorite color. Right? There are points of beauty in each person. And if all we can think about is our contempt and our frustration and our defensiveness, we miss the, the notes of beauty and of gratitude. The next antidote, this one is for defensiveness, and that is take responsibility. Take responsibility. Yes, someone else might have done something, but the moment you put something nasty online, guess what? You put something nasty online. I think the two words that, that sum up the fabric of our societal decay are, but they. You really shouldn't have said that. Well, but they, right? We can't act that way. We should run a different type of campaign. Well, but they, right? You really need to reach out to your family. They're the only family that you have. But they. Jesus says, if you're on the way to the temple to take an offering and you remember that you and your brother aren't getting along, drop the offering because God doesn't want it. What God wants is for you to go and make amends with your sibling and then return to the offering. Defensiveness prevents us, right, from relationship. So take responsibility for your side of the street. It really doesn't matter what people do, but if we say, you know, I'm really sorry I didn't get to the dishes, even though I took out the garbage and I cleaned the house and I picked up the kids, I apologize. I will get to it after dinner. And then stonewalling this is what our, our society has become experts at, stonewalling. If we don't agree with someone, the answer is simple. We cut them out. We avoid them. We stop talking to them. They're toxic. They are, they are harmful to our mental wellness. And I'm not saying that's not true. All I'm saying is the work of restoration involves the unraveling of this toxicity. So the remedy to stonewalling, this is a big one, physiological self-soothing. And what Gottman means is literally, when you're angry, take a walk, right? If you've read something, if you've read the comments online, put your phone down. Self-soothing, take care of yourself so that you don't sin in your anger, so that you don't say something that you will regret. Have you ever had to end a conversation before it got too bad? You know, I have, I have had to end phone conversations with family, and then I felt bad about it. But then I've realized it is better to end the conversation with the goal of being able to go back to the relationship than having the big moment and then deciding that you're never going to speak to them again. Well, the Apostle Paul might well be the father of dialectical therapy if you look at this. But what Paul calls us to is to look at the hatred and the animosity and the ways of the world, and just as he says to the church of Ephesus, Ephesus be different. In the next chapter, he says, sleeper awake. Let us be different than the world. Put away hatred and anger and resentment, and instead let us take up kindness, tenderheartedness, and forgiveness. And so what would happen if in the days and the weeks to come, we would seek to do the work of restoring the fabric of our relationships for the sake of Christ, which is not, I'm not telling you to stop. I'm not telling you to stop gossiping. I'm not telling you to stop being angry at people. I'm telling you to do differently. It's different, isn't it? Don't just stop and put away things. When you want to say something badly about someone, ask yourself this question, how can I love on them? 
It's not easy because immediately your conscience will say, but they, but they don't deserve it. They, but they didn't apologize to you. But they are nasty. But they are ignorant. And Jesus says, but love your neighbor as yourself. Love your enemy and pray for the one who persecutes you. Instead of holding a grudge on someone, ask yourself, how can I do the work of forgiveness? And Paul does this beautiful thing here. See, he says, forgive as you are forgiven. I think someone said that really recently. Who was it? Oh, it was you. About 15 minutes ago, you prayed that prayer. Forgive us as we forgive our sins. And so Paul reminds us that you did not deserve forgiveness. And you were forgiven. And therefore, your neighbor who does not deserve forgiveness gets the forgiveness anyway. And that is what restoration looks like. Dear friends, I have to say, when I preach sermons like this, I roll my own eyes at myself. Because the last thing the world needs is some religious preacher to, to say do and don't, and we need to stop. And what I want to say to you is, please remember this. I always preach in a mirror first. I struggle with bitterness. I am trying to do the work of restoration. I struggle with forgiveness. I am trying to do the work of reconciliation. I struggle with anger. I am trying to do the work of reconciliation. There is no I and you. There is no us and them. There is only we. Christ has broken down the wall. And when we can commit to the work of restoration, only then can God rebuild God's kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven. And when we love differently than the world loves, what happens? God's kingdom is further extended and we find freedom. We find joy. In closing, I want to tell you this last thing. This work is tiring. It's tiring to, to love someone who doesn't love you back. It's tiring to forgive people who we don't think deserves it. But do you know what it's better than? I find the anger and the hatred and the animosity and the anxiety exhausting. The news, my news feed, the community, it is absolutely exhausting. How many of you are exhausted from the constant stream of negativity? If we never do the work, we will never get to raise our arm over our head. But if we do the work of reconstruction, reconciliation, and restoration, God's kingdom will be widened in your life and right here, just as it is in heaven. Amen. In today's reading that AJ read it for us today, one of the phrases caught my attention was a fragrant offering. Paul encourages the readers and us to live in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. When we wear perfume on us, of fragrance, fragrance is spread and it is contagious. Likewise, our kindness, our tender heartedness, and forgiveness is contagious. In reality, however, we also acknowledge the bitterness, anger, and resentment are so contagious. But the good news is, as darkness cannot overcome the light, they cannot overcome the power of love that. God proved for us through Jesus Christ. Pastor Chris reminds us that it requires the work, hard work with God and in God. So let us continue to work together to bear fruit. Our sense of generosity, our gratitude is also contagious as a fragrant offering. In a moment, our ushers will 
pass the offering plate, and I want to remind you our online giving is available at headonfieldumc.org slash give. Let us give our fragrant offering with our deep gratitude and to, to whom who call us to be a part of God's work in and beyond our community today.
God of abundance, in this sacred moment of giving, we come before you recognizing your unwavering compassion and tender mercy. As we offer our gift, we also lift our hearts in prayers for all who are burdened with pain and uncertainty. May your healing touch each of those who are in need. May your love bring comfort and strength to troubled heart today. We entrust to your prayers, our prayers to you, knowing that you hear and respond with boundless graces. Oh God, hear our prayers. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Please remain standing as we sing together our closing hymn number 549, Where Charity and Love Prevail. Friends, as we leave this place, let us put away all bitterness and wrath and anger and wrangling and slander. Together with all malice, let us be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another just as God and Christ has forgiven us. Therefore, let us be imitators of God as beloved children and live in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. Amen. Amen.